Good morning. Thank you, everyone, for filling in for us while we were away last week. We greatly appreciate all of you. Um, we had a wonderful time with our grandbabies, and we're so grateful that um, you all pitched in to help us out. So thank you so much. Um, have a couple of announcements. Um, just want to remember that next week is the second Sunday of the month. And I do realize that it's Mother's Day, but we're going to go ahead, because we're just starting on our potluck schedule, we don't want to mess with it, right? So next week, second Sunday of the month, let's go ahead and do a potluck and enjoy Mother's Day together for those of you that can stay and enjoy it. He's saying, Pastor Mike is saying, guys, step up, try to help out and cook. And let the moms enjoy the feast. So but let's go. So guys, it's up to you. We're going to leave it to you. So um, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are grateful to be here this morning. We bless you. We thank you, God, that you are with us. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here in our hearts, God. We pray that your presence would be here and that we would hear from you this day. And we would be more like you because of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. a better word all the empty claims heard upon this earth it's righteousness for me stands in my defense Jesus it's your blood your blood speaks a better word all the empty claims Heard upon this earth, it's righteousness for me, stands in my defense, Jesus, it's your blood. What can wash away our sins? What can Nothing but your blood, nothing 
but your blood came, Jesus. We praise you for the blood. We praise you for the blood. Nothing but your blood, nothing but your blood came, Jesus. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We just thank him for that. This morning, let's just bow our heads together. Take some time to just center down on the Lord. Recognize that the Holy Spirit is here this morning with us in this sanctuary. What, what a blessing. Lord God, what a blessing it is. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood that would give us a chance, a chance for salvation to live with you eternally. Thank you for that. Pray, Lord, that as we go into this time of worship, that your blessing would be on our pastor as he brings us your message, Lord that we would all be centered down in reaching out for your hand, and I know you're reaching back. Lord, I pray that today we would remember who we are in you, who we are in you. And I pray, Lord God, that as this day comes to a close, that we would all be able to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you'd like, please stand with us.
Um, there we go. <clears throat> I'm feeling a little under the weather, a little under the weather, uh, hay fever. So if I periodically stop to address myself, please excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> wanted to mention we did have a nice time getting away last week. We did enjoy going. Flying to Alabama is not that much fun, but seeing the grandkids certainly is. I... Uh, I did post 44 pictures of grandkids on my Facebook page for anyone who wanted to see, but if you, I can do it again. Is that what you... you, you got, yeah, yeah. Oh, good. All right, guess not. Guess not. I guess not. So yeah, on my Facebook page, my, my personal Facebook page, 44 pictures of grandkids. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, this time of year, it's cool enough, and there's enough rain each week to keep things growing. Makes it rough. In a couple of weeks, it doesn't rain much around here. A lot of things die off. Makes it pretty good. Same thing happens to me in October. I start really getting choked up, but then the freeze hits. I feel pretty good again. And generally around here, we don't have long springs or really long falls, so it works pretty good. However, this week has been cool and rainy, and I'm not doing so hot, so... That's what happened there. Not Corona. Not Corona. <laughs> uh, I, want, I want to read today from the book of 1 Corinthians. Now, I've gone through the entire book of 1 Corinthians on, I think, two different occasions. So I didn't want to do that, but I did kind of take a highlight this one particular chapter. Um, there's some things here that could be very helpful, very beneficial. Uh, better, better double check. Hold on. I, I can feel it. Can you see it? That's the question. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm just being honest. <clears throat> uh, 1 Corinthians 3. And for those who are familiar with the book of 1 Corinthians, there is a church problem almost every single chapter. They're having problems with this. And, pro and the apostle Paul is just, guys, guys, you know, don't do this, do this. And what are you doing over here? Come on, don't do that. And I mean, they're, 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 they're wondering about who baptized who, as if that's some sort of one-upsmanship. Oh, you were baptized, but I was baptized by somebody else. Oh, 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 
you know, uh, they were doing that in one chapter. Another chapter, one of the guys is somewhat sexually immoral, and everyone's just kind of turning a blind eye to it. What are you guys doing? First Corinthians 5. Uh, later on, they're wondering about, uh, is there even a resurrection by the time you get to 1 Corinthians 15? Spiritual gifts are certainly out of control. There's about three chapters dedicated to that, 12, 13, and 14. And so it's really, a, really I think we could subtitle it, you know, 1 Corinthians, how messed up you can be and still be called a church might be, might be a way of describing what goes on there. Well, 1 Corinthians 3, I wanted to share this with you. I think it has, it has a relevance to today's life here. Verse 1. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. Now what he's saying there is, I want to talk to you like you are full-grown, adult, mature, adult, mature Christians. You know, you get these things, you understand the Spirit. And he says, but I can't. I couldn't address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, he uses the word, some translations, carnal, worldly, mere infants in Christ. This explains that there are such things as baby Christians. And baby Christians aren't always going to understand the big, have the whole uh, repertoire of adult Christian things to do. It also means you're not supposed to stay there in babyville, but work your way up towards adulthood. As any infant, that's what you're shooting for, hopefully. Verse 2, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you, are not, for you are not yet ready for it. And then he says, indeed, you are still not ready. <clears throat> there comes a time when I run across people sometimes, they have an entry-level Christianity, and it stops there. They went to church a little bit. They got baptized. They can tell you when and where and maybe what kind of church it was. And that's what they all talk about. Do you all attend a church? Oh, I used to go to such and such. I was baptized, you know, Lutheran or whatever. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> You're waiting for more of the sentence. And there is no more of the sentence. That's their Christianity. There are entry-level things. And it's actually natural to be a, a babe in Christ and grow. That, I'm not saying these things are evil. But you're supposed to grow, and when you don't grow, there's a problem. What happens when your children stop growing? At the age of three, you know, uh, they're still as big as a two-year-old, and everybody else just keeps going on. There's medical difficulties. You're not growing. You're not maturing. Children who take a long time to talk, often, not always, uh, might be an indication of some difficulties. You're supposed to grow at a normal rate. <clears throat> He gives him milk, not solid food. Now, it doesn't exactly say what milk this is he gave him, but I have a clue. In the book of Hebrews, uh, which uh, uh, it doesn't say who wrote it. It doesn't say I, Paul, wrote it, or I, Paul, or I, Peter. So you generally just say the author of Hebrews. If it wasn't Paul, it was someone standing next to him. <clears throat> it says this in verse 6, <clears throat> uh, Hebrews 6, verse 1. I'll just read it to you. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. So he's, what's he telling? The same point. Let's not just work on the basics, the entry-level stuff, but let's move on toward maturity. Not laying again the foundation of repentance. Now he's going to list the basics. These are the things you should have picked up. Entry-level, baby Christianity. Not laying again the basics. Uh, foundation of repentance from the acts that lead to death, repentance, faith in God, instructions about cleansing rites, and that could mean baptism. Usually the footnotes will say that. The laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Those are some of the basics. There is a heaven, there is a hell, you know. There is a good, there is a bad. Work your way through it like, according to what Christ said. It does say laying on of hands, and generally that usually refers to uh, ordaining people or sending missionaries out to everything. It also comes up when it talks about trying to pray for people, heal them. Whatever the case may be, some of that's supposed to be just kind of, we shouldn't have to go over these things again. That's what the author of Hebrews is saying. We shouldn't have to go over these basics again. Why? <clears throat> because he wants to try to take them forward to maturity. So not the first time we've seen this type of uh, language. Grow up. Well, what is a grown-up nowadays? 
in today's language. That's, that's a wild card. It's a wild card. It's not, it used to be, and we're talking, uh, not everybody was alive back then, but it used to be like in the 50s, most, I forgot what the study was, like 75, 65, 75% of all men had finished college or trade school, killed Nazis, and started a family by the time they were 25. That's a whole different way of growing up, an awful quick. Uh, but that's what 75% or 70% of all men fit that category, be it Nazis or the Japanese theater or whatever, you know, uh, even supporting things from home. They were involved. And now it is a bit more muddled. Um, certainly it's not raising a family. That just seems to be almost uh, uh, disregarded by some as being anything even, you know, cool. Uh, something you do as an adult. Um, being responsible for yourself, well, that doesn't seem to be one of the biggies either. For some people, it doesn't. I don't know why. It certainly made good sense as I grew up. I learned things. I learned that the boss told me, if you keep showing up late, I'm going to fire you. Well, Mike had to do some thinking there. Uh, I like to eat, pay rent, <coughs> and I like to stay up late. Right? What, what am I going to do here? Well, I had to stop staying up late. I couldn't watch the late, late show and still make it to work or whatever I was doing. Um, you learn things as you go. And he explains one of the biggest problems as to why the Apostle Paul is talking this way in verse 3. You are still world, worldly, and he explains, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly, acting like mere humans? Now, we just spent a week watching a five-year-old and a two, or a five-and-a-half-year-old and a two-year-old play. And three, excuse me, uh, three, five-and-a-half, three. Uh, watching them play, and sometimes somebody would take someone's toy. And there would be a great deal of commotion about this. And sometimes something was said like time to go to bed or time to turn off this or time to... And sometimes there'd be a great deal of commotion about that. Now, I'm not completely shocked. Why? Because the kids three and five, you know, there's a, I don't expect as much from them. Now, if someone's 25 and acts the same way or 35 or... I've even seen people well into their 60s and 70s who like to whine and shout and stop. They didn't, somehow didn't get past that stage. A lot of people would say, that guy is old, but he is emotionally immature. I'm not talking about any of you. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Where's my... Uh... There we go. <clears throat> Are you not still worldly? For there is jealousies and quarrels among you. If that doesn't remind you of watching some young kids play, I don't know what does. In fact, some of these things even go on into, have you ever been around high school jealousies and quarreling? You know, why? Because you sat next to Timmy, you usually sit next to me, and then that creates a whole thing, you know. Uh, and hopefully as things go on, it, it, we grow out of some of these things. Because if we didn't, life would be rough. I got to work and someone took my parking spot, and it's my parking spot, and I always parked it, you know. I mean, you could just, you, you could have a meltdown before you even made it to the work door. Just, just experiencing the parking lot. Walmart will do that for you. You know, I'm just trying to shop and this guy cut me off and I got a bad basket and I haven't even made it past the greeter yet. You know, uh, you need to, you have to start learning how to take some of these things in stride. You really do. That's part of being mature, being responsible for yourself. So I think adult Christianity is a bit more like that. Adult Christianity is more mature, more responsible for itself. If our baby entry stuff is following the teachings of Christ, I'm sure mature Christianity is really knowing the teachings of Christ and following them. In fact, sometimes I think mature Christians isn't a matter of time, though time can certainly help. I think it's a matter of obedience. And that comes hard for some people. A lot of people think it's a good idea until they're told they have to do it. And suddenly, oh, I don't like that idea. I've seen that at church, at school, at work, you name it. Jealousy and quarreling among you. Are you not acting like mere humans? <clears throat> so jealousy and quarreling is acting like mere humans. Regular people, common folk. 
You're not acting like Christian people, but you're acting like regular people. This is a great lesson right now. This means that jealousy and quarreling is normal when you get a bunch of people together. They're not acting like Christians. So it can become uh, mere humans. You're just acting like regular human folk. <clears throat> now that actually explains quite a few of the uh, meetings I've ever been to. I've ever been to. And that could be a PTA meeting or a rotary thing. or I, th I think of the Teamster meetings I went to over the years. Uh, a lot of people, <coughs> well, that's not fair. I didn't get a raise. Well, he's not really basing it on what that guy did or went through. He's basing it on him. I, I deserve as much as him, even if I don't have a license. Even if I'm not out there in the snow. Even if I'm, you know, it's funny how that works. Jealousy and quarreling. Acting like mere humans. Now, that is a great lesson to learn. People out there are going to act like mere humans. If you realize this, life will be much better for you. If you don't realize this, you'll be horribly disappointed and upset every time you leave the house. Right? I'm just telling you, this is just a hard rule of life, but people need to be reminded of it. It ain't easy out there because people are merely people, if you will, merely humans. I'm going to throw out some bonus information. I don't consider this to be the gospel truth, but something that can help. I'm talking about in the world situation. And that is, uh, uh, what was the, the egg thing you used to use? Remember the egg, the quadrants in the egg, Don? Okay, what it was, uh, Don was pastor here for many years. What it was, <clears throat> was an egg shape with four lines through it, and it was personality types, strengths and weaknesses. Well, that goes, all, the original one goes all the way back to like Hippocrates or somebody, right? He originally had four major Personality types. Everybody was one of the four major personality types. You first start reading that. Really? Only four? But then it explains, uh, well, this guy normally does this. And you think, oh, I know a guy like that. You know? And this guy mostly does this. <laughs> I know some guys like that. And this guy does it. Oh, yeah, that might be me. Uh, and then one over here. You know. And what it was, was in, a, in the original uh, uh, Greek, it was a choleric, melancholy, sanguine, and phlegmatic were the big words. Uh, since then, there have been studies where it likens them unto uh, animals. I think Trenton Smalley's uh, similar work was based on animals. There was the beaver, and that was a meticulous worker person. You know, hands-on, gets the job done, focused. And there was the otter. Look at me, I'm playing, I'm out here splashing around. Woohoo, I'm an otter, right? And then there was the lion, who's in charge. And then there was a golden retriever who was just faithful. Well, as you, you can apply it to, I can, I can apply this and see it in my work, my life. I can see it in my friends' families who had four or five people. Those two were in this category, that one's in. And you can major and minor in some of them. That's fine. You know, you can be very uh, controlling. And, and of course, the, the extremes of these are both good and bad. I've been at an event where nobody knows what's going on. Everyone's just standing there. And somebody, that natural born leader, controller person, all right, all right, let's just get this going. Uh, I, I saw Gwen save a wedding that way one time. Everyone is standing around. What do we do? What do we do? And nobody had planned much. Well, before too long, Gwen had three bridesmaids over there, some flowers are coming from here, and the music's going to start on, you know, got it all worked out. It's not easy living with a person like that, but it's great, <laughs> great for a wedding. Great for a wedding. Uh, you can see that control person. Uh, this person likes to joke around. They're not serious like me. They joke around. They're always telling things. You know, waving their hands about. You know, look at me. That the passive person is like that golden retriever. That uh, sanguine, uh, sanguine, sanguine. Uh, it's just a person of peace. Not sanguine. Uh, phlegmatic. Uh, is a person of peace. They just go with the flow. Now, those people are great to have. When you're a young person trying to get to the Seven Eleven. That guy just jumps in the backseat automatically. The alpha males are going to blows over who gets the right shotgun, right? But the, the, the go with the flow guy just jumps in the backseat every time. Well, that's great. We Less to fuss about. You love a person like that. And ask them where they want to eat. I don't know, wherever you want. Because they don't want to cause any problem. They don't want to, you know. And that's great, but sometimes I don't really have a hankering. Pick something. I don't know, I don't know, you know. 
And then you pick something and like, oh, okay. Was that right? Was that wrong? Maybe you should say something by now. So <coughs> I recently watched a video where he likened all personality types unto Winnie the Pooh characters. All right? And he was spot on. Uh, Winnie the Pooh was the thinker. What about this? And what about, oh, bother. You know, he's thinking his way through things. Rabbit was a control guy. Uh, Piglet was the faithful tag-along friend. And who do you think the show-off was? Tigger. Tigger. You got it. You guys are good at this. <clears throat> it was Tigger. And he's showing those same type of person. Now, do I think that this ends all? We just It's not modern psychology, like I said, because it goes way back. But <clears throat> if you realize that people are different and they're wired differently, and they have different drives and things, it helps you navigate life a little bit better. You just realize, this guy isn't the difficulty. Everybody in his group is, you know, because I'm in the opposite group. Uh, in fact, because I do joke around sometimes, if I'm around a real serious person, two things happen. They think I'm loony because I'm always joking, and I think they're idiots because they're not laughing, right? Because <laughs> what I just said was pretty funny. You know, uh, and that's those extremes clashing. So if you learn that, this is just this is just living through life because it's talked about the regular people uh, working your way through the through the mess of the the common uh, what was the word mere humans. Learning some of these things can help you; they really can. Well, <clears throat> I don't think Christians need to know this. I think it can help Christians. But you've already been told such things. Now think about this. We're trying to get something accomplished. We're trying to work together. Well, A, we're supposed to have a lot of love going on. Spoiler alert, it's all over the Bible, right? Love one another, care for another, you know, all these different things. So you're supposed to have that going for you. You're supposed to have the Spirit of God helping you drive through life. Now think about it. You remember the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law for the King James. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, that's patience, because you suffer a long time. Patience, gentleness, goodness, faith. Meekness means I don't have to be right all the time. Temperance, against such, there is no law. If you come to the group with these things already on board, and they also come to the group, well, you don't need to learn about personality types. You have everything you ever needed right there. We had a conversation this morning about... I think there's a lot of things in the Bible that are already there that could have helped a lot of people if they would have read them and applied them. I really do. So I'm not trying to say that this stuff fixes everything. Uh, there's quite a few things in the Bible that already fix it for you. Uh, in fact, the fact that we get anything done around here, I think is God's Spirit and kind of a, a modern-day miracle. Why do I say that? Well, I told you, most of you know, I spent 25 years delivering restaurants. Regularly, you get to know the people. And two partners couldn't agree and torpedoed a well-known restaurant. I can think of several times that happened during the course. And they could have kept it going had they been able to work it out, but they couldn't. One wanted point A, one wanted point B. They couldn't work it out. <clears throat> These things will happen. Be prepared mentally. You won't be bothered so much. And as Christians, you've already been told this before. <coughs> Then he explains what exactly the problem is in verse 4. <clears throat> For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? So one was saying, well, I'm following the Paul guy. He came here and taught a while back. We're following what he said. And the rest of them are like, well, we've been following the guy he sent to fill in for him, Apollos. You know, we were following him. You see, the fact that you're even trying to one-up each other on who your teacher is, is being petty. You're being mere humans. Now, this shouldn't be a too, hard, a, a too difficult thing to find. People are always trying to one-up. It makes them feel good. That's why they do it. Uh, I, I mean, I've met, uh, I've met people, uh, oh, you have that kind of car. I had one, but I one-upped it. They'll tell you the new kind of car, you know. I'm just happy I still have a car. You know, the engine starts, kind of. Um, and they'll do that. I've seen it in that. I've seen it in, uh, oh, you live in Fernley, you know. Uh, 
uh, and one-upping because of where they live, you know. Uh, in fact, the good news is police don't live in Silver Springs. And the good news, and the good news for Silver Springs people is you don't live in Stagecoach. Yeah. That's a joke, but if you've ever, we've grown up, it's not a joke, Dad, it's this, it's not, it's the truth. Now, half my family lives in Silver Springs, and I can tell you at least half of them are upright, good standing. They're all, they're all church going folk, they're doing fine, all those who live down there. They're following leaders and one-upping themselves. In fact, as you read on and you get in that spiritual gift debate that starts off or 12, 13, or 14, they're one up each other on which spiritual gift you have. Uh, and it sounds cooler. You know, I, I, I get how it works, but grown adults shouldn't live like that. Grown Christian adults certainly shouldn't live like that. We've already been told they're all members of one body. That was similar to some of the points you made last week. We were, uh, what was all the creatures in the barn or whatever, uh, in the band, choir, choir, uh, all these different people, different sounds, different types working together. We've already been told this is how it works. This is the church. You shouldn't be shocked when there are different people with different ideas. You navigate through them. You work through them. You apply love and acceptance and kindness and even steadfastness. Stick to your guns if it's a hill you really want to die on. But if it's not, don't. Don't do that. He explained. Uh, here's an interesting thought as I uh, dress myself here. Could this happen in a church today? Yeah. A couple nods from the senior Christians in the room. Uh, and yeah, how could it happen today? Well, you got a pastor who's doing okay. A lot of people like them. But you got an up-and-coming deacon. Or an up-and-coming youth pastor. And a lot of people like him. And one thinks the A should be the more speaker and B. And can't work it out. Can't take turns. Can't, and pretty soon, church split. I like to say I've never seen or heard about such things. But I have both seen and heard about such things. So that same mentality. Uh, in fact, I'd like to think if we had somebody really moving and shaking. They were affecting a particular group. We start another church service just for that group. You know, somebody's reaching out to the uh, whatever community, Hispanic community. Let's get a Hispanic service going. We don't need to take over the church or throw away the church or kick them out. We could try to work it out. But not always the case. Verse 5. What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? He explains, only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. So you guys are trying to choose off which, which leader you had. It's not about that. He says in verse 6, I planted the seed. He laid down the first words when he went through the area. Uh, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. And the focal point always comes back to God, Jesus, God. And if you keep your eyes on that, everyone's looking that way. The stuff in the periphery just doesn't bother you too much. It doesn't bother However, you take your eyes off of that and start watching everything around here, you can see all sorts of things. You'll notice people's attendance. Oh, that guy doesn't come to church as much as I do, you know. You'll notice if somebody walks up and puts money in the plate or not. You know, I put a lot of money in that plate. How come that other person never gets up and puts an envelope in? You know, people can do that. Get all sorts of sidetracked and come up with all sorts of ways and reasons as to why they're cool and everybody else isn't. I usually worry when someone comes up to me and says, what are we going to do about these people? Uh, well, we are these people. You know, so we're going to have to figure it out. It's not all about you. I said it was an old Christian rap song. Two things in this life are true. One, there's a God. Two, it ain't you. Uh, I think a lot of people can learn from that one. A lot of people can learn from that one. So he says... Uh, <coughs> Excuse me, verse 7. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. Verse 8. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose. What is it? Trying to grow stuff. And they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. They'll enjoy in the harvest if we're talking about regular farming stuff. Or rejoice in heaven if we're talking about Christian stuff. Verse 9. For we are co-workers in God's service. 
You are God's field, God's building. <coughs> He's trying to set the stage here and help them out by reminding them of who they are and where they should go from, from baby stuff to maturity. Here, they're not that hot. The, this is the apostle, the, the, often referred to as the great apostle, writer of the majority of the New Testament apostle. This is the apostle Paul. Amazing testimony. Went from Saul of Tarsus to Paul. Great guy. And he says, what? We are, for we are co-workers in God's service. That's it. That's the point. You are God's field, God's building. Well, if we're talking about work in the field, clearly the field is where you grow things. Clearly, if there's a building around, it's where you store. Oh, yeah, bring me some. Thank you very much. Oh. Those who know my favorite beverage, turn your eyes Thank you. I hope it works. I may have an allergic reaction to water. I don't know. We'll see what happens. I do drink a bit of diet soda. But thank you. I'm not trying to. Thank you very much. So, <clears throat> we're co workers. You're God's field where things grow. You're God's building. A building in a farm setting is going to be where you put your equipment or store your grain or dry your hay or something like that. In a big Christian setting, and he often refers to God's people as being building blocks in God's temple. So there, God's field is everything he set you out to do. And I've talked about Christianity as a day-to-day thing. It's not Sunday only. Like a car. You can go to a gas station once a week and maybe even go to one. They don't do it as much as they used to, but check your vital signs, your fluids and such. I'm going back to the 70s, I think. Uh, but that's fine, but you don't consider that driving the car just because you went to the gas station. The car is for everything else in between those gas stations. You know, that's a necessary pit stop, so to speak, but there's more to it than just that. And Christianity is that way. There's more to it than just going to church for an hour on a Sunday. You live it the whole week through. And that's that field out there. And we're part of his church. Uh, In fact, there's churches that I'll have named like Living Stones, uh, working on this idea of being God's building blocks for his temple. Think about that. As opposed to a specific temple in Jerusalem or something like that, his church is now made up of stones, but they're living stones. Churches are called that. Just the way my brain works, maybe, I don't know. I thought about that, and I looked up, I didn't look up Living Stones because I know there's multiple churches named that. I looked up uh, Holy Rocks. I wonder if anybody used the name Holy Rock, right? Found three on Google. Found three on Google. Uh, Now, they may be holy and rocking out. I don't know. But I just was for fun. Then I looked up Blessed Bricks. Do you think there's a church called Blessed Bricks? Well, oddly enough, I didn't find one. I just thought somebody was running with the idea. I did find a video where a guy was blessing the bricks of his church. So there, there is that. There is that. It takes me a long time to come up with a sermon as I meander on these, on these different ideas. God's building. Verse 10. By the grace God has given me, not through my power, he says, not through my wit, my intellect, my, you know, my efforts. Grace God has given me. I laid the foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. But each should have, uh, each should build with care. For no one, verse 11, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one that's already laid, which is Jesus Christ. You start building up your church on a popular speaker or this or that, or some people tell me they have the greatest such and such ministry at their church. I think that's great, but I hope there's more to it than that. <clears throat> Here, the main point comes back to Jesus Christ. Verse 12, if anyone builds on the foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, he just mentioned several items there, their work, verse 13, will be shown for what it is because the day, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. Now, I'm, I'm sure somewhere out there in the world someone's interpreting this stuff literally. 
All right, well, I guess if I'm going to build a church, I need to build it with the gold, silver, and costly stones. And, uh, you know, not what I, exactly I think he's talking about. I think he's talking about their work will be shown for what it is, the things you've been doing with your life and time on this earth, the things you've been doing after you've heard the word of God, your work. And that can take place at the place of business. It can take place on the highway, the Walmart, everywhere. It says it'll be real with fire. Well, it's very clear that if I had all those items, uh, the gold, silver, and costly stones <coughs> would be doing a bit better than wood, hay, or straw. You're going to be left with nothing but ashes. Mm. I just started drinking more of that. That wasn't bad. Uh, <coughs> it'll be real with fire. Verse 14. If what has built survives, the builder will receive a reward. Now, I think he's talking more about our motives is why we do things. You know, are we really trying to promote God or Jesus or us? And I think about that when we're talking about the children fighting. Are you trying to promote the teachings of Jesus or your own personal desires? Quite often, your own personal desires. Pit stop. <sighs> Verse 15, if it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, yet will be saved, even though as only, only as one escaping through the flames. Now here's a verse. <coughs> Sounds like you can get there by the skin of your teeth. All the stuff you thought you were doing well has been burned up. But the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though it's only one escaping through the flames. I don't think you're supposed to shoot for that, right? Everybody else is in heaven, flowing right robes. You come in, little smoldering stuff over here, ashes, you know, everywhere, burn marks. I don't think that's what you're supposed to shoot for. The reason I mention that is because apparently some people, that's what they're shooting for. Verse 16, don't you know that your cells are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in your midst? So God's temple equals bodies or temples, the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. And a little pit stop here, a little side road. This is one of those where temples, our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit type, type verse. I said, clearly, it's mentioned here in 3 and again in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. The funny thing is how I usually hear them used. The number one way I often hear them used is, well, probably, Three major ones. Some people quote the verse, the uh, body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And then they'll talk about exercise. Or, I did this one time where I actually showed three different videos of Christian speakers applying this verse to three, those, these three different things. The next one is uh, diet. Temple of the Holy Spirit, got to eat right. Some people use the verse to justify exercise. Some people, either, I'm not saying you shouldn't exercise. I'm not saying you shouldn't eat right. I'm, I'm not suggesting this verse isn't talking about those things. And finally, does anyone know what the third one is? How do they use the verse, the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, commonly? You got an idea? No? Okay. Uh, and how you dress. You dress up for church. Body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Got to clean her up. Got to tune her up. Um. None of these are in context. Look what he says here. If anyone destroys God's temple, verse 17, God will destroy that person for God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. So he's saying that you are these building blocks and you together, all of us, are God's temple. Not the building, but the people. And if you're tearing down someone else, who are you tearing down? God's temple. That's not a good place to be. Not a good place you want to be. Verse 18. Do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools, so that you may become wise. Basically saying you think you got it figured out, but you don't. 
You think you're smart, but you're not. You need to realize you need to stop being so smart. Realize you ain't got it all figured out, and then you can see what God is doing. Verse 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. It is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, he says, verse 20. The Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. And, yeah, you don't, you're not working with a... Unless the Lord builds a house, they that labor, labor in vain. God has to be part of it. You can come up with great plans and ideas. And if that ain't God's direction for your life, things aren't going to work so good. <clears throat> uh, verse 21. So then, no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, which is often a way he refers to Peter, uh, or the word, or the world, or life, or death, or the present, or the future, all are yours. If you realize that, what are you going to worry about? Not much. If you realize that, when someone does take your parking spot, life goes on. When someone doesn't give you the credit you think you deserve, life goes on. God knows. God knows what I did. And that can bring you a lot of peace. Because in this world, somebody may com completely forget what you did in a short amount of time. You can help a guy two weeks in a row. The third week you call him, uh, no, I'm busy. You like to think you had a favor coming, you know. I'm busy, can't help you. All are yours. And look what it says in verse 23. And you are of Christ, and Christ is of God. Final point. If you can remember that, you are of Christ, and Christ is of God. All this worldly talk, all this frustration and jealousies and envies, just don't bother you so much, because you have a whole different standard you live your life by. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, I thank you for this time, <coughs> this hour. And your word, may it speak to our hearts and change our lives. And in turn, may we change the lives of others. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.